Yeah, hello everyone. Very excited to be here. I will be talking today about the future of open hardware in a verifiable decentralized world. And to give you an overview of what I will be covering in this talk, I will first of all give a brief intro and context about uh, the whole scope, about me, about Riot, the institution I'm representing, about the OSHA, the Open Source Hardware Association, and about the Open Hardware Month, which is happening this month. Um, the main part of my talk will be dealing with what open source hardware is, what can we understand about open source hardware, what is verifiable hardware. I will give a few examples also to make it tangible. Um, I will talk very briefly about um, hardware security modules and trusted execution environments and solutions uh, for the future that are based on open silicon. So to give a bit of context, my name is Matthias Tarasiewicz. I'm the director of the Riot Institute. I'm also board member of the OSHA of the Open Source Hardware Association. And please get in contact with me um, in case I'm talking too fast or the slides are confusing or something. Um, basically, um, I want to also refer to a, a talk I've been giving um, this week, which was called The Past, Present, and the Future of Opt-Out with Open and Libre Hardware at HCPP 19, the Hackers Congress Panel in Nepolis, which is dealing also with open hardware. So um, it was a little bit of a longer talk, about one hour, so this might be um, more of a contextualization if you're interested. This should be like online already, I guess. So, um, but briefly to introduce Riot, we are an independent institute. We're working with um, crypto economics, future crypto economics to, me, to be more precise. We're working with privacy technologies and open hardware. And we're doing this since 2009 and formally as this organization since 2012. And we have a um, background also working with diverse uh, open hardware projects. This is maybe a more well-known project. This is the Apertus Open Source Cinema Camera, which is a um, full camera based around open hardware. So every part of this camera, except the, the, the lens, of course, are open hardware. So um, you can see my presentation at the 32C3, which I have been given at the Chaos Communication Congress, um, which is explaining the project. It's an older project, but this project is still going on. It's um, also interesting to see how kind of long lifespans these open hardware projects have. So I can strongly suggest if you want to uh, uh, see um, a quite large open hardware project to uh, uh, see this talk or get more information on the apertus.org website. You might also remember this thing. This was actually a magazine we have been given out at the last DEF CON. So it's a kind of a newspaper. It's kind of a book um, obfuscated in a newspaper. And we have been distributing this at the last DEF CON. And um, this uh, month, we have the Open Source Hardware Month, the Open Hardware Month uh, from the OSHWA. And in this context, uh, Riot, and we will be giving out this kind of bags with um, also the Future Crypto Economics magazine, but also with uh, Openism, Conversations in Open Hardware, which is a, a book and a conversation series where we try to figure out and find out how projects are, um, which kind of different open source strategies projects have, and why are they open sourcing um, really um, hardware, how they're approaching it, and how far can you go in doing so. So maybe to contextualize also the Open Hardware Month, what will happen in this month. It's already running the month, and there's a lot of um, other events coming, coming up. This talk is also part of Open Hardware Month, and there's uh, worldwide events, mostly from hackerspaces, from industry, from a lot of different actors. There's workshops, there's a lot of other formats, and there's a lot of communication um, and documentation going on, so there will be a lot of um, projects made visible online on the, under the hashtag OHM2019 on Twitter. Um, you can also still post some pop-up events on the ohm.oshwa.org. And maybe to briefly explain what this OSHWA is, it's a uh, 501c3, so it's an um, association, it's an NGO, and its main purpose is to organize conferences and community events, to um, educate the general public about open source hardware, um, to organize the open source hardware movement around shared values and principles, um, to collect, compile, and publish data on the open source um, hardware movement, and to provide a painless way for creators to indicate that their products meet a standard for open source compliance. And what that standard means, uh, or what that context means, is very um, um, visible on this website. I can strongly recommend to take a look at, so you also get an idea what kind of projects are out there. It's a very good directory, in my opinion, to see um, what kind of certifications are already out there, what, who under, underwent this certification process. I also want to um, direct your attention to this uh, thing. It's the Open Source, uh, it's the Open Hardware Summit, which, will, uh, which has a 10-year anniversary, and it will happen um, in March uh, next year in New York. So you can already get tickets or become a sponsor if you're interested. Um, very excited about this one because this will be a, a very large event. But um, now to the main part of my talk. So I will briefly introduce what open source hardware is. So there's a 
kind of longer description that you can find from opensource.com. I copied this from opensource.com and briefly to, to get us into the, into the topic, open hardware, open source hardware refers to the design specifications of a physical object which are licensed in such a way that said objects can be studied, modified, created, and distributed by anyone. That means um, in opposition to open source software, in hardware, we have a lot of documentation. We have um, a lot of um, blueprints, logic designs, a lot of um, um, kind of descriptions about the object we are trying to um, open source. And these all are ideally made available to everyone. Um, there's a very good um, sum up of this whole um, movement and about how the Oshawa came, um, came to be. This is um, a book which is called Building Open Source Hardware, which also explains all the pitfalls that come with op uh, open source hardware and the differences also from a logistic uh, point of view. This has been um, edited by Alicia Gibb and features also a lot of uh, writers and a lot of different projects from the open source hardware context. But to explain better what it is, what is actually open hardware. So um, as Michael Weinberg here um, uh, was writing in this book, hardware is already born open. But we have to understand also that hardware is very different than open source software because um, in a way uh, we have to understand that software is um, um, based on copyright and software protection, the GPL and C uh, CC licenses are based around, um, um, is, are considered artistic work, while hardware falls under patent law because it's considered a useful article or things that do stuff. So um, that means um, there's a lot of patents out there in the hardware world. So um, how kind of open hardware projects are usually protected then in a way is through, um, is through trademarks, as is very um, evident and very visible with the Arduino project. Um, which is a trademark, although there are a lot of knockoffs of the Arduino, everyone knows the name, so that the trademark is secured in a way. There's a lot of specific open hardware licenses. I listed here three of them. There's the Tabro license, there's the CERN open hardware license, where the second version is currently being in, dra uh, in draft. It's a very interesting read if you are interested uh, in looking this up. Um, it's a lot of discussion also on what are the limitations of, uh, of licenses. And uh, uh, GPL v3 is also a very common license, not super common, but would be the ideal license in my opinion for, for open hardware. So these are the two most uh, common uh, known open hardware projects. So this is the Arduino, you all know it possibly. It's, a, it's coming from the maker movement. It was, it's considered to be one of these tools for the maker movement. And of course, open, like, like um, um, rap rap printers or 3D printers are also considered open hardware. Not all of them, but um, the Ultimaker, is, uh, Ultimaker one is an open hardware piece. So in my opinion, uh, we can see two effects of open hardware, which are in my opinion really viable and which are different to closed sourced hardware. So it's very educational. That means it's educational because you can study the designs, you can study the, the uh, specifications, you can look at the actual hardware, you can understand what's actually going on. Um, that also means you can potentially write your own firmware um, about, uh, uh, with that hardware that you are looking at. And verifiability, which is the point I'm, I'm, I'm stressing much more because uh, in a um, um, much more con a much connected world that we have today and also in regards to uh, cryptography and blockchain, verifiability is key in my opinion. So also if we look at this kind of idea of zero trust, um, um, verifiability is, is very important in order to um, make sure that we don't have to trust, we can always verify. And this is very complicated with modern hardware. It's actually not, not even possible in most cases. So I want to a little bit um, explain this idea of verifiable hardware. And we had a very interesting panel discussion uh, um, today in the sun. It was a little bit hot, but we had a very uh, interesting approach. We discussed how vintage hardware could possibly solve this kind of security nightmare, this verification debacle that we have these days. Um, Long story short, we're using a lot of non-verifiable hardware these days. So if you look at your phones, if you look at all these kind of components that you have around you, computers, whatnot, all are not really verifiable. That means if I really want to know, okay, what's going on? Is there some computation that happened that I want to make sure that isn't compromised? It's really, really hard to do so. So I want in this context also um, refer to an interesting um, certification program from the Free Software Foundation uh, who um, identified and uh, basically listed a lot of devices that uh, can be used in, in, in modern day hardware and in uh, desktop computers that are um, not having binary blobs. That means you can actually verify them by making sure that the firmware hasn't been compromised. Also maybe to contextualize a little bit, um, the Linux kernel has a lot of proprietary drivers. Um, so there's also the Linux Libre um, fork of Linux, which um, tries to de-blob uh, in a way the whole Linux kernel. So um, usually if you remove all the commits from Linux Torvalds, you are almost good to go with the almost Libre kernel. 
Um, this is a very interesting piece of hardware. Um, I also own this, and I can strongly suggest any uh, uh, crypto anarchist or cypherpunk to own this device. It's, a, um, it's an older ThinkPad X200, and the interesting piece, um, or the interesting part of it is actually that you can use um, this because it's verifiable. It runs uh, LibreBoot, so you can make sure that there's no uh, BIOS backdoors inside. You can basically run, um, um, it, it has not no Intel management engine on it, so you can basically make sure that in a way, um, you create your keys, and if you use it in a kind of an uh, um, offline manner, you can even make sure that um, your keys aren't compromised. But it comes with a few um, kind of pitfalls, in my opinion. So we have two problems still also with this kind of Libre hardware and with this old vintage hardware, if we want to use this in kind of high security applications. We have SSDs, which are a problem, because they, again, embed another ARM processor, which could be potentially compromised. And there could be other backdoors um, in the CPUs that we don't know about. Um, we uh, in the context of the um, just shown device, um, this would be eliminated because it's an old vintage device. It's actually, um, I would say, like 10 years old or something. So there's a few attempts to solve this problem, also from the open hardware movement. And SSDs are the best um, um, kind of place where to put your implant. Um, if, in case you want to actually make sure that, to survey someone. So this is the OpenSSD project. It's a very interesting uh, project because it also educates people on how SSD controllers function. And um, there's another uh, newer um, approach to um, uh, SSD and to, to um, other kind of verifiability parts of hardware, which is uh, the Chips Alliance. It's a common hardware for interfaces, processes, and systems. Um, two interesting pro projects you should definitely take a look, look at. So I want to also point here at the common hardware we're using in day-to-day um, -day crypto activities. So um, in this context, I want to also refer to a small exhibition archive, which is like traveling here around the um, DEF CON. It's called um, Materialities of Modern Cryptography. And it's actually um, a selection. It's a, um, um, an, a hardware archive that we are collecting uh, since approximately 10 years, which um, features like different prototypes, different um, non-release prototypes, materialities, but also like this kind of um, modified um, um, this modified dices that you see in the uh, right top, um, which are all um, um, kind of explaining different security concepts and how we are in a way, um, because we don't trust hardware, again, falling back to this kind of um, um, age before microcomputing. So um, I'm strongly suggesting you take a look at this. Also, this is part of the open hardware dialogue, so we're trying to figure out in, um, um, how um, can we explain and educate more about hardware. So, but coming back to this kind of day-to-day -day crypto hardware. So, um, of course, a uh, lot of people know crypto um, um, hardware wallets. A lot of people use hardware wallets. These are three um, quite common hardware wallets out there with a very different concept behind them, also from a hardware perspective. So, we have on the left side the Trezor, which is an open source hardware, which means it's verifiable. But here you also see that it's very interesting because while we have the specifications and everything um, available, um, parts, so the components of the open hardware are not verifiable at all because you have to trust the producer, the manufacturer, that, these, that, these, that um, the components are not compromised. So we can verify the treasure the most we can verify um, a hardware wallet out there, but um, that doesn't mean it's secure necessarily. So you have to make sure that you secure it yourself. On, in the middle, we see the Bitbox um, has a kind of a different uh, concept. It's partly open, which means it runs open source software, but uses a hardware security module. So you have to trust the manufacturer of the hardware security mo module that um, this is not compromised. Uh, and then we have the ledger on the right-hand side, which is completely closed source. So here, just an example, if you're um, um, kind of the, the verifying type, you would um, actually be able to create your own Trezor hardware and then um, load the firmware on it and, and run the firmware. Here's an example of a hardware-based project that uh, there was a talk yesterday, I guess, um, the Status Keycard, which is a Java card-based uh, hardware solution, which is basically an open platform to develop your own workflows. It might be also an interesting um, aspect, but it's, it's also closed. It's Java card, it's Oracle. So another um, element you came across possibly is hardware num random number generators. There's a lot of them, but I made um, a few um, screenshots here of nice ones. This is the Ziffer, in my opinion, a really beautiful uh, crafted device, and here's the Altus Metrum, uh, a more Libre device, so this also um, is, these are common devices to generate entropy and randomness in order for you to create um, um, safe keys. Of course, there's also hardware tokens, and there's a lot of them because they exist since a long time. I just uh, made a few screenshots of a few of them, and um, these are very common devices to identify yourself and to, to do all sorts of security um, uh, protocols and, and workflows, and there is even 
op more open um, elements uh, um, than the ones that I was showing. Here's, for example, the SOMU, TOMU, and FOMU series, which, is, which started as a kind of an open, open source uh, project. Um, it's also um, um, certified by the OSHWA. And this is also an interesting hardware. This is the Nitro key. Um, it's kind of a multi-purpose uh, cryptography hardware. You might have come across this because Purism um, delivers this with their Purism laptops in order to verify that your supply chain hasn't been compromised. So they're sending you this um, device on the left-hand side in a different parcel so you can actually check, okay, is my BIOS compromised or not? So uh, all the things I've shown you are not really verifiable or are at least only verifiable to some point. And we're using them on a daily basis. So what can we do about that? I want to briefly also go into the modules I was referring to that are um, parts of all these kind of devices or partly um, uh, parts of these devices I was showing, which are hardware security modules and to briefly explain what they are. So they are physical, physical computing device, safeguarding and managing digital keys. So um, we need them for strong authentication, crypto processing. They're usually in hardware wallets, such as the Ledger and Bitbox, but they're also in the Java card, status key card. We see them in the Nitro key in mobile phones and IoT devices. And then on the other hand, we have trusted execution environments, which are isolated um, execution environments where you can do secure processing, where you can do untampered processing. We um, have um, a few of them listed here. There's the AMD secure execution environment, ARM Trust Zone, Apple Secure Enclave, Intel SGX, and others. Just to give you an example of the Apple Secure Enclave, um, I'm usually Nobody knows what's going on, so there has been a lot of like reverse engineering going on until people know, okay, what's, what's happening, what, what's actually existing there, like who, who uh, you, you can't really access it without like being Apple or uh, without like signing a, a ton of NDAs. So all of them are sometimes not documented, you don't know what's going on. They're not really verifiable for, for, th for you, so you trust the third party in the whole security concept. And some of them, if not all, will be hacked in the future. I mean, most of them are already. We, we saw Spectrum Meltdown, we saw a lot of existing exploits out there, we saw a lot of um, um, attempts to, to break all these devices, and they will be hacked. So um, I wanna show one example where this could be actually um, in the future changing. And um, while we're not still there, I still wanna um, um, make the point that Open Silicon can in this context um, solve this security nightmare that we're facing with all these hardware pieces, and it could also make our hardware verifiable. So here is a very interesting project I wanted to point at. It's the RISC-V. It's um, an open source hardware instruction set architecture. Uh, and on the left, uh, on the right-hand side, you see the Freedom E310 um, SOC, which is the first RISC-V chip uh, produced, uh, was produced by C5. And there are more of them out now. So basically, what's interesting about these things um, is there are already existing um, replacements in the development that would replace HSMs, TEs, and so on. So I wanted to, in this context, point to two um, interesting projects which I have found interesting and which are heavily worked upon. So one is the Sanctum, the Minimal Hardware Extensions for Strong Software Isolation. There's a very nice paper from Costan et al. from 2016, in case you're interested. And it offers simpler security analysis than SGX, which means like also um, from an um, auditing perspective, it, it gets easier um, because it has lower complexity. And this, kind, this approach of lower complexity in hardware is a, is a very interesting approach, in my opinion. I think we are, we'll, we'll be getting there in a few years. And this specific um, solution targets a rocket risk five core, and you can already test this online. But maybe a more easy starting point to get uh, working with RISC-V is the Keystone project, um, the open framework for architecting trusted execution environments, which is um, very interesting because, in my opinion, um, this is already very far. There's a lot of documentation out there, and you can, you can um, get this uh, going in your workflow very, very fast. So in my opinion, RISC-V is a very interesting um, um, movement or a really interesting step in the future where we will see that open silicon can potentially solve our security nightmares we are facing with current uh, day hardware. But also there's other approaches. So uh, there's, for example, the vintage uh, approach. This is maybe um, not so common approach, but um, there's um, already a community out there which is looking at vintage hardware and like completely um, um, controllable or like verifiable hardware because it, um, it is old and you can not so easy tamper with it. There's um, also very interesting um, uh, context and um, um, project I have been referring to in my talk at HCPP, so I um, would strongly recommend you also listen to this talk. Um, where potentially vintage hardware can also help disarm uh, um, nuclear warheads in the long run, but because there you have a really, really complicated trust setup. But in conclusion, 
And this um, is actually already the end of my talk. Um, current hardware is hard or almost impossible to verify. This is a problem. We trust third parties. We, on the example of the HSMs, on the TEs, on modern day uh, um, com um, CPUs. So they are not zero trust. So we need, in my opinion, more open hardware to verify um, and to be able to verify and for education. So in order, if there's digital winter coming, we need to be able to, to know how to repurpose devices. We need to understand and to educate other people. We need to know um, how this functions. In my opinion, um, on the example of the verifiable delay functions, the VDF um, Alliance project, um, this is a very good example because this is a project where you need open hardware, in my opinion, because um, it's, in my opinion, the best, best practice example. Um, if you realize the, the verifiable delay functions with open hardware, it ensures fair access to the fastest implementations. So you can uh, also look at open hardware as a kind of a, um, um, approach to um, create equilibria. So in my opinion, RISC-V can change the game, but only also if we make sure that there are enough cores with open licenses available. So there's a lot of um, um, existing implementations of the RISC-V cores which are with closed uh, software, with uh, closed licenses. So I'm strongly um, I'm suggesting we look at uh, and we make sure that there are enough uh, really open licenses available for these cores, such as the GNU license. So you can follow further on all the other open hardware talks at the um, Open Hardware Month site at ohmoshwa.org. And you can also um, get in contact to discuss further at the Rider T site, or you can visit us today at uh, 4. We have a small get together together with Chain Security at the Elsewhere exhibition in, uh, it's in the third floor. Thank you very much. Thank you.